Good evening, Chair. Calls to order auditors update. Uh, Council, we're going to welcome Ms. Brooks here this evening, County Auditor. Good evening. Good evening. As you all know, I am Crystal Brooks, the County Auditor. I am here to let you all know what's been going on in my office, to let you know the status of the work we've been doing, answer any questions you may have, and I'll jump right into it. So you all should have a copy of my update. These are the audits that were in our audit plan for fiscal year 2022. Um, this year we had 13 projects that were included in the audit plan. 12 of them are done. One is in progress and one has been postponed. There was actually an extra one added to the list this year. Um, so starting at the beginning, we did an audit that is a follow-up to prior audit findings. In this project, we looked to see whether or not the recommendations we've made in the past have been addressed. Um, we found that there were 11 recommendations that were closed and there are 12 that will remain open for follow-up. Um, we did an analysis of water and sewer billing. This was to make sure that the bills that the county had sent out for water and sewer seemed to be in the correct amounts, that payments were applied to the correct accounts. Um, we finished that project in November and there were no recommendations related to that audit. Um, at the time, we were just looking to see that the amounts billed were correct and they were. The county is implementing a new water and sewer billing system and so in our next year, fiscal year 2023 audit plan, we will review that new system. We last summer took a look at petty cash accounts. We looked at five of them for uh, Sod Run, the Jury Commissioner's Office, uh, the Haverty Grace Senior Center, the McFall Senior Center in Bel Air, and um, amusement park ticket sales. There were no issues related to any of those accounts. All of the petty cash accounts had either cash or receipts that totaled to the amount we expected those funds to be. Um, the county's financial statement audits were completed. Um, in October, uh, following the financial statements being audited, there's also a single audit. It's the audit of the county's federal grants that we've received. Um, there was one finding included in the single audit report. It was related to a CARES Act grant reimbursement that was reimbursed in the correct amount. It's since been corrected and the overpayment was repaid. Um, and then also, we look at the financial statements for the county's affiliated agencies to make sure that they've been completed. That includes um, the volunteer fire companies, the Fire and EMS Association and Foundation. Uh, we look at the financial statements for the Hereford Center, the community college, libraries, and the schools, even though those do roll up into the county's financial statements. Uh, what we had noted is that for the affiliated agencies, um, a lot of the volunteer fire companies just don't complete their financial reporting on time, um, and so that remains an issue. Uh, at this point, we have received all of the ones for fiscal year 21, though, so that project is closed. We did an audit of the county's payroll controls uh, earlier this year that was to determine that essentially all employees were being paid the amounts that they were supposed to, that the calculations looked correct based on pay rates, that pay adjustments were correct. We looked to see that leave payouts were correct and that benefit deductions were correct for employees. There was one finding resulting from that audit. It was related to benefit deductions. There were a few employees who were um, in either the payment rate for plans that were, for example, uh, individual coverage or an individual and spouse instead of the person being in a family plan or an employee who was hired, <coughs> excuse me, an employee that was hired before 2010 being paid or charged the rates for employees who were hired after 2010, those sort of things. Um, management advised that there were reasons for those particular few that we found. It was because of a manual process. The new um, process that was implemented this year for benefit selections is automated so that employees are going through and reviewing their benefit selections and the amounts that are going to come out of their checks and that information will post automatically to the payroll system. So uh, they advised us that the issue was corrected. We have not reviewed that yet, but we will when we get back to our status of prior audit findings. We also, in that project, because there was an outage in the timekeeping system for a few months, um, we found that there were some procedures that we couldn't complete at that time. So we'd plan to go back and check and see the issues that hadn't, that we weren't able to test. 
um, we added that project to our audit plan and we completed those procedures um, just last week actually. Um, the payroll control supplemental audit, there were no findings resulting from that project, but we went through and made sure that employees' leave balances were correct and that the accrual rates for paid leave was correct, so no issues there. Um, in the fall last year, we audited the county's procurement practices to make sure that all of the guidelines in the county's procurement code had been followed for large purchases. Uh, we found that generally the county follows the procurement guidelines. There was one finding um, related to the monitoring of spending. Uh, the procurement office is a small department and they've had a lot of turnover and they just don't have the bandwidth to really delve into how much we're spending with a particular vendor unless it's been brought to their attention. They look at high level spending but they can't capture necessarily a vendor who we've spent more than $25,000 with if that spending is aggregated across departments or across separate contracts. So our recommendation was that the Department of Procurement needs more staff um, and so we'd hope that they can implement that whenever <laughs> there are resources available. Um, we did an audit of the county's uh, real property tax billing and collection controls. That audit looked at whether or not the bills that we sent out to taxpayers were correct and complete and also that their payments were received uh, correctly and completely. Late charges were assessed when they needed to be and we didn't have any issues in that audit. It was completed with no findings, um, which is a good thing. Property tax is the county's largest revenue source. The next project was an audit of capital projects for the county's affiliated agencies. Uh, for the schools and the community college, to a degree, the libraries, when there are capital projects that uh, have been approved for those agencies, they choose their vendors, they pay their vendors, and then they request reimbursement from the county for their capital projects. So we wanted to see that the amounts that we had paid to them had underlying support. So we went to those agencies, um, looked to see what their invoices looked like and that they agreed to what the county had reimbursed. Um, there were no issues related to that. All of those things tied out the way we expected. Uh, just recently, actually today, we finished an audit of environmental services billing and collection controls. This is related to uh, money that is collected at the landfill and also collected by Maryland Environment Serv Environmental Services uh, for trash that is hauled to Baltimore County's waste transfer station. We wanted to make sure that uh, haulers were licensed by the county, that they had submitted all the required documentation to be allowed to do business with the county, in addition to making sure that they were being invoiced the right amounts and paying the correct amounts and that money was then being sent over to the county from Maryland Environmental Services uh, timely and completely. Uh, we also looked to see that uh, for private vehicles at the landfill that it seemed like all of those transactions were captured. So we looked at video to see you know, how many cars came in and out. Uh, were we able to verify that those lined up with transactions that had been processed in their system? Um, ultimately, out of that audit, there was one issue that we reported. It was related to bonding for haulers. There were five trucks for two vendors separately that had licenses with the county for their trucks, but that we couldn't find appropriate um, insurance bonding information on file. Uh, management advised us that they were going to retrain the staff involved and add an extra review so that there's better communication between MES and the county government to make sure that the bonds are fully captured before the license is issued. Um, like I said, we just issued that report today, so we haven't had a chance to follow up to see whether or not that has been fully completed yet. Um, I think their expected completion date was September 1st for that. We did an audit of cash receipts. This project was intended to make sure that when people send money to the county, whether it's for water bills or tax bills or tickets, parking tickets, that that money was captured either at the window or through whatever electronic mechanism that the money was posted to a relevant um, uh, 
relevant revenue system. So if you sent money through an electronic payment that it would post to your water account, if that's where it was supposed to go, or your sewer, or your, excuse me, property tax account. Um, essentially, we found everything looked the way that it should for that. Um, the money that is collected by the county's bank gets to the county, it's got all the information that needs to be there to make sure that it goes to the right accounts. Um, we plan to do an audit of fleet maintenance management um, and at management's request we have postponed that to the fall so that'll be in our audit plan for fiscal year 2023. Um, because we postponed that we were able to work in our project of uh, the payroll control supplement which I already mentioned. Um, then last one, well actually two more. Um, we did audits of hotel occupancy tax for four local hotel operators this well, last month. Uh, we looked at the Hampton Inn in Aberdeen, the La Quinta Inn and Suites in Edgewood, Extended Stay America in Bel Air, and the Spencer Silver Inn in Havard Grace. We wanted to see that the, that the payments that the hotel operators were sending to the county were supported by their operating records. So. Um, Hotel operators are supposed to collect a 6% uh, hotel occupancy tax from their guests and then in turn send that money to the county. Um, but they just provide a reporting form saying basically, here's my revenue for the month, here's what 6% is and with a check. Um, so we went to all those hotels, we looked to see you know, how many people stayed at the hotel for whatever days, what were the rates and just to make sure that what, we, what the county was getting made sense. Uh, there were no issues for any of those hotels. Um, lastly, our audit of purchase card controls is in progress. This is something we do every year throughout the year. And so because uh, the last purchase card transactions for June won't be posted until July or available until August, uh, we should be able to report on purchase cards in August. But that project is in progress. So the only thing other than those things that I would note related to the fiscal year 22 audit plan is that uh, we meet with the audit advisory board throughout the year and we talk to them about what we've been looking at, what we're seeing. The last meeting was May 24th, but our next meeting is August 23rd. Those are open to the public and you can get more information about them on the county auditor webpage. So that's all I've got related to the current year audit plan. I can answer any questions anyone has before I jump into what's in our proposed audit plan for next year. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, Mr. Jandredana. Thanks, Crystal. Good, uh, good evening. So a question going back to hotel occupancy tax mm -hmm. and the 6%. Um, are they charging 6% if somebody is using a voucher or uh, being paid for somewhere else? that they're getting in the room? Is there any way to track that? Because I... Uh, Do you mean like if somebody I, was staying at a hotel and their employer was paying for it? No, or what do you I, mean? I mean like if you've got <laughs> rewards and you've built up oh, your rewards yeah. and, you're, and you have a room, that that room should be taxed for that day or for those two yeah. days or for three, those three days. Is there any way to check on that? Uh, we look to see, well, no. It, you, they wouldn't pay tax on that. So they wouldn't pay tax. You pay tax they, on the amount that the hotel is charging you to stay. So they might still collect the occupancy tax, even though they're getting a night for free. But they're not going to. They don't have to. They might not report it. There's um, no way to double check on that. Well, a hotel wouldn't char wouldn't collect it if they weren't charging you anything, because it's got to be six percent of the room rate. If the room rate is zero, there's <coughs> no tax always, on it. They always charge it, even if you have a room rate that's zero, and you've got a room comp. They still charge you the. That in other states, they still charge you the tax, the usage tax, and everything. The room rate might be free, but the tax they're still collecting. I don't know how they would determine what the basis was for that tax. I mean, we didn't look at individual, we didn't look to that degree. We looked to see what was the revenue, show us all the revenue, what's 6% of that. 6% um, less anyone who stayed longer than 30 days. So we looked to see what the processes were for backing out that income, but I don't think we would have been able to capture reductions in their revenue. So I've been to other states where they still charge you the use tax, 
state tax and sales tax. Even though the room is comped, mm -hmm. they're still charging you the, those base rates. So I'm wondering if we're if we're doing that or not doing that. How do you how do we check that? I think you'd have to look at every individual customer's receipt, okay. and for the procedures that we did, there, we would not have captured okay. that. If, that, if their rate was zero, it would have been zero. Okay, that's fair. And then I, one other thing you you mentioned about the uh, environmental service billing and collection controls, mm -hmm. there was vehicles that didn't have insurance. Is that what I heard you saying? Mm, that they hadn't submitted a bond to the county, so they're supposed to pay a $2,000 bond to the county. They did have insurance. Okay. That, that's a separate requirement. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Ginger Dan and Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Council President. Um, good evening, uh, Ms. Brooks. Uh, it's just a um, caveat off of uh, uh, Tony G's, or Councilman Tony G's, I can't say his last name all the time. Um, <laughs> um, question. So, uh, for the homeless, have you have you dug down on that? Like during the winter, when the homeless folks are staying at these hotels, are we at the county or any nonprofit organizations? Are they paying that? <coughs> Not have been something we would have looked at. Okay. Um, to my knowledge, if the county was buying a hotel room for someone who, who is unhoused. Uh, if they paid a certain rate, they should pay the hotel occupancy tax. I can't think that there is any sort of waiver of it because the government was paying for it. Um, there are a set, of, uh, a set of purchase card numbers, credit card numbers, that's in a range that the state allows hotel tax to be waived for. Okay. So, I, I couldn't tell you for sure whether county employees' credit cards fall on that list, but I can check and follow up. Okay. Um, and s uh, secondly, you were talking about procurement. Mm -hmm. um, when was this brought to procurement's attention? As that, far that as, they far need as more staff? needing needing more uh, staff. Oh, they've known. They know, they've and known? and they would like more staff. I think the matter becomes its budget. You know. It's got to be put in the budget, and it's got to be funded. So it has. So, so in essence, it has not been fixed, correct? Uh, to my knowledge, there are no additional employees in procurement since we finished the audit. Because I, you know, I just say that because this is something that your your audit update is something that we, sh as a council, should have prior to the budget, so that when we're going through the budget and procurements uh, sitting in front of us, and this isn't for you. This is just for for the common good of the people, but this is some this is the information that that I think that we need prior to um, you know putting our stamp of approval on the budget because if if procurement knows that there's a problem, um, the county auditor know that knows that there's a problem and continuously brings this problem up then we, as a council, should go ahead and make sure that this problem is fixed so um but with that being said, <coughs> Council President, I'll yield my time back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Anyone else? Mr. Wagner. To Mr. Johnson's point, um, that would, you're right, <clears throat> but we need a better working relationship between the administration and the council prior to the budget coming over here because when we find out, and you're right, they've looked for additional help for some time, for other reasons too. There's procurement agents that are overworked and, and way too many uh, accounts for each one. But if we had a working relationship where the council and the, the administration actually sat down and devised a budget that we were all more acceptable of and knew the problems going into it, then we could craft it in a different way. Coming up at, at the 11th hour in a budget session, finding that out, We've got nothing to do with that unless the executive wants to say, you know what, you're right. I'll step up and give you three more people in procurement. It just, it, there's a whole revamping of how it should be done to make it work better that needs to occur. And, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Mr. Johnson. So, can I add a couple things to what you all just said? So one, um, I can, as I'm going through and doing budget analysis, I will take your feedback and make sure that I throw in things there into the budget analysis so that you all know where there were prior audit findings. We had done it in the past and it didn't seem super helpful at the time, So, but we can add that back. Um, the other thing is that, so while procurement needs more staff, they are getting all of their basic 
duties done. They're, they're a pretty efficient group, um, but they are small and mighty, I guess. Um, and so the things that they are not being able to get to because they don't have enough staff, it's the monitoring of the overall, you know, you're in the details, you're not seeing the whole forest. Um, they try to get some of that done, but they can't get down to the detail, like things that we would have pointed out to them um, because they just don't have the bandwidth. And those areas are going to be places where if the county is spending more with the vendor, we should be able to try to get bigger volume discounts and they, you know, don't have the bandwidth really to do as much of that as they would like to do. So. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Anyone else? Ms. Brooks, you want to move on? Yeah. So uh, on the agenda for tonight's legislative session, uh, you all will have a resolution related to performance and operational audits for fiscal year 2023. So I wanted to walk you all through what our proposed audit plan looks like and how we came up with the plan. Um, as always, we have a countywide risk assessment where we look at all the business processes that the county has. Um, we look to see what can go wrong in those business processes. If something went wrong, um, how significant would the problem be um, and how widespread would the problem be? What's the significance and the impact of a problem? Uh, once we've done that, then we say, okay, well, some processes are going to be riskier, some are going to be more critical to the county's functioning. Um, we prioritize them and look to see, well, when was the last time this process audited, excuse me, when was the last time that process was audited? Um, what were our results from prior audits? And then figure out what do we need to look at most critically. Um, the county charter requires that audits that have uh, operational and performance audit procedures related to them needs the council to sign off. That's why you all will have a resolution in front of you. Um, but our audit plan, as we look at the risk assessment and figure out which of these projects are going to be, we're talking to you all, we're talking to the audit advisory board, we try to talk to um, the county executive's office or the director of administration's office to find out what their priorities are. So we design a plan that includes things, uh, administrative tasks like, you know, our quality assurance procedures, making sure that we have time for training, paid time off because people get sick, um, making sure we have time to attend council meetings if we need to, that we have time for budget analysis and fiscal note uh, preparation. Uh, then there are some projects that we do every year. Um, we make sure that the county's financial statement audit is completed. There's an external firm that does that, but my office is required to make sure it happens. Um, we audit petty cash accounts every year, not every one, but a sample of them. We are going to be auditing hotel tax uh, every year, purchase cards every year, following up on prior audit findings every year. Um, so those are the things we always do. The things that we are specifically adding to that for fiscal year 23 includes um, a fleet maintenance management project, which I mentioned uh, we're pushing back because management asks us to. Um, we're looking at recruitment and hiring practices. We'll look at the new water and sewer billing system to make sure that its controls operate the way that they are expected to. We'll take a look at banking and investment controls, inventory controls for public works. Uh, because this year is an election year, some of you all will be leaving office, but also the county executive will be leaving office. So we will do exit audits to make sure everything is as it should be. Um, for any director and deputy director who is leaving county service. In addition to, we'll be reviewing all of the accounts for all of you council members, whether you're staying or going. So um, that'll happen right around the time um, of inaugurations. Uh, we are going to look at grant and aid monitoring <coughs> controls. We will look at isu license issuance and billing. We'll take a look at zoning <coughs> requests. And those are the big projects. So. It's a lot of the things we've done in the past. There are a few new things in there. Um, the only other thing that's also in the resolution is just that it directs that, you know, the timing and extent and nature of the audit procedures that we do will be based on um, auditor judgment and cumulative not audit knowledge and experience. Um, so it's how we do our work. And I can certainly answer any questions that you all have about the audit plan or the proposed audit plan. Thank you, Crystal. Anyone have any questions? And you say the next audit advisory board meeting is on the 23rd? August 23rd. 
questions, anyone? Thank you, Crystal, for your update. Thank you all. And I believe uh, now that we're past the 7 o'clock uh, time period, we'll go ahead and move right into our public hearings for Bill 22-011, 22-012, 22-013, 22-014, 22-015, 22-016, 22-017, 22-018, 22-019, 22-020, 22-021, 22-022, 22-023, 22-024, 22-025, 22-026, 22-027, 22-028, 22-029, 22-030, 22-031, 22-032, 22-033, 22-034, 22-035, 22-036, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-040, 22-041, 22-042, 22-043, 22-044, 22-045, 22-046, 22-047, 22-048, 22-049, 22-050, 22-051, 22-052, 22-053, 22-054, 22-055, 22-056, 22-057, 22-058, 22-059, 22-060, 22-061, 22-062, 22-063, 22-064, 22-065, 22-066, 22-067, 22-068, 22-069, 22-070, 22-071, 22-072, 22-073, 22-074, 22-075, 22-076, 22-077, 22-078, 22-079, 22-080, 22-081, 22-082, 22-083, 22-084, 22-085, 22-086, 22-087, 22-088, 22-089, 22-090, 22-091, 22-092, 22-093, 22-094, 22-095, 22-096, 22-097, 22-098, 22-099, 22-100, 22-101, 22-102, 22-103, 22-104, 22-105, 22-106, 22-107, 22-108, 22-109, 22-110, 22-111, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-119, 22-120, 22-121, 22-122, 22-123, 22-124, 22-125, 22-026, 22-027, 22-028, 22-029, 22-030, 22-031, 22-032, 22-033, 22-034, 22-035, 22-036, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-040, 22-041, 22-042, 22-043, 22-044, 22-045, 22-046, 22-047, 22-048, 22-099, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-119, 22-120, 22-121, 22-122, 22-123, 22-124, 22-125, 22-026, 22-027, 22-028, 22-029, 22-030, 22-031, 22-032, 22-033, 22-034, 22-035, 22-036, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-129, 22-130, 22-131, 22-132, 22-133, 22-134, 22-135, 22-136, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-119, 22-120, 22-121, 22-122, 22-123, 22-124, 22-125, 22-026, 22-027, 22-028, 22-029, 22-030, 22-031, 22-032, 22-033, 22-034, 22-035, 22-036, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-127, 22-128, 22-129, 22-130, 22-131, 22-132, 22-133, 22-134, 22-135, 22-136, 22-137, 22-138, 22-139, 22-140, 22-141, 22-142, 22-143, 22-144, 22-145, 22-146, 22-147, 22-148, 22-149, 22-150, 22-151, 22-152, 22-153, 22-154, 22-155, 22-156, 22-157, 22-158, 22-159, 22-160, 22-170, 22-171, 22-172, 22-173, 22-174, 22-175, 22-176, 22-177, 22-178, 22-179, 22-180, 22-181, 22-182, 22-183, 22-184, 22-185, 22-186, 22-187, 22-188, 22-189, 22-190, 22-191, 22-192, 22-193, 22-194, 22-205, 22-206, 22-207, 22-208, 22-209, 22-210, 22-211, 22-213, 22-214, 22-215, 22-216, 22-217, 22-218, 22-219, 22-220, 22-221, 22-222, 22-223, 22-224, 22-225, 22-226, 22-227, 22-228, 22-229, 22-230, 22-231, 22-232, 22-233, 22-234, 22-235, 22-236, 22-237, 22-238, 22-239, 22-240, 22-241, 22-242, 22-243, 22-244, 22-245, 22-246, 22-247, 22-248, 22-249, 22-250, 22-251, 22-252, 22-253, 22-254, 22-255, 22-256, 22-257, 22-258, 22-259, 22-260, 22-271, 22-272, 22-273, 22-274, 22-275, 22-276, 22-277, 22-278, 22-279, 22-280, 22-289, 22-290, 22-291, 22-292, 22-293, 22-294, 22-295, 22-296, 22-297, 22-298, 22-299, 22-300, 22-301, 22-302, 22-303, 22-304, 22-305, 22-306, 22-307, 22-308, 22-309, 22-310, 22-311, 22-312, 22-313, 22-314, 22-315, 22-316, 22-317, 22-318, 22-319, 22-320, 22-321, 22-022, 22-023, 22-024, 22-025, 22-026, 22-027, 22-028, 22-029, 22-030, 22-031, 22-032, 22-033, 22-034, 22-035, 22-036, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-040, 22-041, 22-042, 22-043, 22-044, 22-045, 22-046, 22-047, 22-048, 22-049, 22-050, 22-051, 22-052, 22-053, 22-054, 22-055, 22-056, 22-057, 22-058, 22-059, 22-060, 22-070, 22-071, 22-072, 22-073, 22-074, 22-075, 22-076, 22-077, 22-078, 22-079, 22-080, 22-081, 22-082, 22-083, 22-084, 22-085, 22-086, 22-087, 22-088, 22-089, 22-090, 22-091, 22-092, 22-093, 22-094, 22-095, 22-096, 22-097, 22-098, 22-099, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-119, 22-120, 22-121, 22-122, 22-123, 22-124, 22-125, 22-126, 22-027, 22-028, 22-029, 22-030, 22-031, 22-032, 22-033, 22-034, 22-035, 22-036, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-040, 22-041, 22-042, 22-043, 22-044, 22-045, 22-046, 22-047, 22-048, 22-049, 22-050, 22-051, 22-052, 22-053, 22-054, 22-055, 22-056, 22-057, 22-058, 22-059, 22-070, 22-071, 22-072, 22-073, 22-074, 22-075, 22-076, 22-077, 22-078, 22-079, 22-080, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-119, 22-120, 22-131, 22-132, 22-133, 22-134, 22-135, 22-136, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-040, 22-041, 22-042, 22-043, 22-044, 22-045, 22-046, 22-047, 22-048, 22-049, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-119, 22-120, 22-131, 22-132, 22-133, 22-134, 22-135, 22-136, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-040, 22-041, 22-042, 22-043, 22-044, 22-045, 22-046, 22-047, 22-048, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-117, 22-118, 22-119, 22-120, 22-131, 22-132, 22-033, 22-034, 22-035, 22-036, 22-037, 22-038, 22-039, 22-040, 22-041, 22-042, 22-043, 22-044, 22-045, 22-046, 22-047, 22-110, 22-112, 22-113, 22-114, 22-115, 22-116, 22-113, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-114, 22-
We will uh, accomplish this task through these three bills. If they're approved, we must then go to the State Critical Area Commission and get their final approval. We have, for that reason, been working directly with the State throughout this process for over three years to make sure that we make changes that they will support. Uh, so, to show you a little bit of a timeline here, uh, the bills address changes to zoning, subdivision code, as well as the zoning map. Um, they refine the program manual. So, program manual is necessary because there's very many details to the critical area, too many to really fit in the code. Some of these can be very specific circumstances like timber harvest or agriculture and so forth. So. Um, that we've been working with the Commission throughout these past three years and uh, we'll go to the Commission in October. Um, some of the details uh, have, um, like I said, worked with the Commission staff and one of the most important changes to the process from 2011 when it last came before the com uh, Council is that the Commission worked to look at all the different ordinances across the state and they developed a model ordinance and they asked us to look at how we could fit the model ordinance into our code. So we work with them to, now some things don't fit exactly. It's, uh, you know, Hartford County zoning ordinance has been around a long time and, you know, you have to make sure everything um, aligns with other definitions that might be applied in other sections of the code and so forth. But, but we work with them to make sure all those changes were made. Um, So I realize the members of the council are quite familiar with zoning, but I want to make this presentation useful to anyone who's new to the critical area and um, just share a few quick slides to show how it works overall. Um, it's a zoning that only applies to some properties. So you can see in this picture a view of the Otter Point area. There's a few locations that you might have visited. Um, actually, on Saturday I was at the Nita Light Center. I think I saw one of the council members there. So. Um, there's a, a few locations that some of you might have seen here. And uh, if you look at this map, you can see the regular base zoning. Every property has um, different types of zoning for residential, commercial, industrial. See those uh, uh, lighter brown and orange colors uh, associated with uh, residential and red with commercial and purple with industrial. Um, so each one of these has the base zone, but only some properties have the Chesapeake Bay critical area. And what you can also see in this picture is the zones seem to follow the property lines in most cases. I think with the business zones, you'll see that's not exactly the case. But for the most part, they follow the property lines. But the critical area is different. Uh, critical area follows a natural boundary, which is the mean high tide line or average high tide line and it goes back a thousand feet from that. So you see with those yellow areas, the critical areas going into the Anita Light Center, it includes the, the um, Yacht Club, other properties like that. So uh, it becomes like an overlay. So there's new rules that are applied to those properties that are within that thousand foot buffer. And some of the overall rules come in the form of the land uses of the critical area. There's three different land uses, IDA, LDA, and RCA. Um, intensely developed areas, IDA, these are the areas where there's almost no natural habitat. They were intensely developed before the critical area law took effect in 1984. This diagram is up at the top. At the diagram you see the area that looks kind of urban. That's a good example of IDA. Um, limited development areas are areas with some habitat amongst development. Um, then diagram, that's sort of in the lower left. Those looks like a residential subdivision with some HOA property, open space, that kind of thing. And then resource conservation areas, those are the, for low density de development, mostly natural habitat. In that area, the diagram looks like a park or perhaps a farm. So let's put in some local context. Uh, here we see Water's Edge. This is IDA, intensely developed. Um, you know that area is a mixed use with a conference center that you've probably been to or residential warehouses. Why is it IDA? Well, it was a shoe factory before the critical area. So that's, that's why they mapped it that way. 
uh, LDA. Uh, on Boat Club Road, we have examples of limited development area, or LDA. The picture demonstrates medium to low density housing, uh, typical of the LDA category. And then uh, along the Bush River near Cranberry Run, you can see areas mapped as resource conservation area. This is for very limited de development, parks, low density. Um, the um, a good example is the Swan Harbor um, uh, Tidings Park that's shown in this picture. So how did the maps change? Was this something that we did as planners? This is actually uh, everything in the critical area is the average high tide line. So you can see the tidal chart in this picture of the Bush River from um, earlier last month. The peaks in the chart are high tides measured in feet. So state and county officials went out during the similar peaks of high tides and field checked where the water line stopped during high tide. Uh, they also looked at other natural features that are indicative of tidal lines like the species of plants and so forth. Uh, and uh, marked the locations using geographic information systems, which collect geographic data, put it into a computer. Um, this is a lot more high tech than it, uh, than it was back in 1972 when the phone cord couldn't exactly reach the beach. Um, there's presently 4,751 properties in the Harford County critical area. With the new map, there'll be 4,799 properties in the critical area. So the main reason for the increase was public land. If a critical area, uh, the critical area was on state or county park land, we often expanded it all the way to the property boundary. So if it, if it was a change, we just went to the property boundary. Um, so the increase in that case was the most restrictive category, RCA. So we were increasing the amount of RCA in our overall inventory. Uh, state also required that tidal wetlands be mapped RCA. That wasn't the way it was done before. These aren't developable, developable areas anyway. They weren't then and they weren't, aren't now. Um, so the impact to private property rights was minimal. Um, I'm going to take you on a short tour of where the changes in the map occurred. Um, like I said, they're mostly minor changes. They touch about 500 properties in the county. It's about 11% of the property that it's in the county's <coughs> critical area. Nearly uh, all the properties had some critical area already on it. Um, the state handled the outreach to every single property owner. They sent cards to advise them of the map change with contact information. There were a few questions. Um, we addressed each one of them. There it was a, usually just they wanted to see their property on the map and know a little bit more about it. So some of the changes that, like I said, um, if you start, we'll look up in the Deer Creek area, which is number one, um, then we'll look at some changes in the Swan Creek, uh, Oakington area, and finish with some of the Bush River tributaries. <coughs> so up in the Air Creek, Deer Creek elbow branch drainage, so this is like, if you're talking roads, Craig's Corner, Stafford Road. Um, why are we all the way up here? Uh, if you fish, you know that the Chesapeake Bay license is required downstream from the railroad bridge. So that gives you an idea of where the tidal impact is. So um, in area one, we mapped from these tidal areas to certain areas of, like I said, at the state boundary. So if you look at that map, you can see there's an opaque uh, green color and then there's more of a translucent green color. The opaque is representative of the um, uh, existing RCA that's mapped today and then the translucent is where we expanded it so you can see that that's a larger area and uh, now looking in the, um, uh, the Swan Creek Creek area you can see we've got um, all three different areas shown so you can see again that that opaque green um, the translucent green representing the RCA, but you also see pink, which uh, over kind of in this area, and there's a little margin there of increased IDA, and uh, then the yellow 
should have bought the 2.5s, but it's somewhere over here, <laughs> the reading glasses, but it's somewhere over here, there's a yellow change that uh, it expanded a little bit. I can follow up if anybody has any questions on that. Um, mostly north of 40 in the Grace Run area, so like Philadelphia, South Stephanie Road. Uh, we again, we can see uh, er this is areas of our existing RCA, new RCA, existing IDA, new IDA, ex existing LDA, new LDA. And so when you have private properties where the limit expanded, um, we put the RCA on existing forest conservation easements, um, open space areas, rather than um, we used, we used, tried to avoid having impact to existing properties as much as possible. And um, in this area here, again, uh, you can see where we've expanded the critical area. These are these are new LDA here surrounding because these are existing residential properties. So we applied the LDA in this case. We applied the RCA because this property has some type of easement controlling it. Most important part of the critical area uh, is the buffer. Um, which is mostly 100 feet from the high tide line, but it can be different, like in Gabler Shore is a good example. Critical area is intended to, um, buffer is intended to lessen the impact of people living and working within the watershed. So in, here in Abingdon Beach Road on this picture, um, parts of Baker Avenue, you can see the existing buffer, buffer is in yellow here. And um, the salmon color represents the modified buffer. So um, when you see development in the buffer, the existing development, it's grandfathered, new development activities and disturbance are not permitted in the buffer. So um, some parts of the buffer are changing. And uh, so there, th these maps show areas where those changes across the county. Um, in, on this map where the teal green for the regular buffer and the more fuchsia color for the modified buffer. So again, we made all those changes according to the direction of the state in the review of the maps. So we reviewed the maps, um, field checked the streams. Some streams don't flow regularly anymore. Um, in those cases, the restrictions were relaxed and or at least made no, stringent, no more stringent than before. Um, So this is a good example here um, in the Oakington Manor area of Swan Creek. This is Habit Gray zip code. Um, there's a stream that isn't flowing regularly anymore. So if you look at this yellow line, um, this is the um, from the hydrology maps, but we're not when they went out there and saw that, looked at that stream, they were not observing it flowing any longer. And so this is the proposed buffer. And in case, like I said, we used modified buffer, which is uh, less restrictive and allowed by the commission uh, for in cases where you have uh, properties that are going to be in the buffer but are already occupied with residences, sometimes for many, many years. So this is Forest Knowles area, Springdale Court, and the Foster's Branch community. So we used modified buffer so we wouldn't be holding them to the strict no development requirements of the regular buffer. So there are many changes to the code, but like I said at the beginning of the presentation, we followed the state model ordinance um, where it was possible. Now, if we couldn't follow it exactly, we met with them and we went over the changes and got some understanding because we didn't want to have you guys approve a, 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 a law change and then have it go to the commission have them have an issue with it because then it would just come back to the council. So it wasn't in our interest to have that type of uh, situation. So like Megan had said at the beginning, the structure of the code is much, much easier to follow. We hope that, you know, plain language is going to help it, us uh, enforce the ordinance better and people be able to follow it better. Um, the violation process is clarified. 
um, the content notification content of notification letters we are not letting people go forward with other permits like building permits occupancy permits until they resolve their critical area issues with this change to the code mitigation requirements are clarified variances are consistent with the rest of the code the language um, we increased fee and load it hadn't been changed in years and years um, actually I had a couple examples where someone I asked them to send their estimates from uh, the landscaping company and it looks like we got the fee and load just about right it averaged out to be about the, s the same price as the what their uh, contractors had budgeted when we have the clarification of staff roles in the enforcement process so, so I'm getting near the end here but um, a good example of mitigation I just wanted to show because a lot of people find the critical area somewhat daunting let's say you want to build a shed on your property and you live in the critical area so this um, in order to do this shed it's 200 square feet so we go to a table uh, with the ordinance that gives specification for how you can meet that mitigation of 200 square feet so you have the opportunity to use different types of trees and you can see in that table trees and um, shrubs to provide their mitigation so you see the homeowner there she's she's working on her mitigation and that's what I had in my prepared notes so I'll hand it back to the president or if you have any questions or direction so thank you Joe um, Megan while we're talking can you speak to the letter that we received from Theo today the Riverkeeper um, yeah, I mean, as far as the specific changes in the substance to the actual zoning code regulations, Mr. Gallagher just spoke um, generally to those. Um, specifically, a little bit more information um, for the fee and loop, for example, I believe in the current code it's $1.40 per square feet, and I think we increased it to $4. So, and remember, this was originally codified in 1985. So, and that had not been changed since that time. Mm -hmm. So a $2.60 increase, if my math is correct, I don't think is, is a lot, considering it's been almost 30 years since we implemented the original program. Um, so things like that um, we changed. The enforcement procedures is another thing that was clarified. So it's, we have specific in items in there that have to go into a notice of violation if someone is found to be in violation of the code. Um, the letter, so it specifically says in there what the Department of Planning and Zoning would need to put in that violation notice and the procedures that it would need to be followed as far as restoration and mitigation. Um, we, as Mr. Gallagher said, it, it specifically indicates in there that if you've got a current violation, you can't come in and apply for a permit. Um, we're not going to issue that permit until you have complied, cleaned up, mitigated, restored, whatever it is that needs to be done. Um, we put out we, we also added some um, language about in the manual specifically with the staff the language was really broad about just the director of planning and zoning so we specified in there you know chief of long-range planning environmental planner um, so people know who to go to if the public wants to know who who can they talk to about this who's governing and handling the administration of this code we specified those staff roles and titles um, that's another change that was made um, as far as some of the other really technical changes um, we did change, we used to have terminology um, buffer exempt area. We changed that language to modified buffer area. Mr. Callahue talked about that a little bit because people were getting confused thinking the word exempt means it doesn't apply to me. Well, that was never the case. It was just less restrictive for the reasons he indicated such that you already have development there. You already have a residence there. Um, but it doesn't mean you're exempt from the regulations. So we thought that was confusing language. We changed that in the current bill to call it the modified buffer area. I think that makes a lot more sense to the citizens. Um, and obviously the staff has been administering this program for 25 years. This is not a new program to the county, so they're all very familiar with how it should be administered. But this helps the public, um, I think, a little bit more. Um, there was some mitigation charts and tables that and one of the examples that w was in the slide that is now part of the code so people can clearly see what they have to do to mitigate uh, what kind of trees what kind of straws um, trees had to be replaced there was nothing specific in the bill i think that talked about shrubs being replaced correct me if i'm wrong on any yeah. of these technical yeah, no, you're getting, yeah, yeah, I'm um, checking as you go so we we specifically put in there that if you take out a shrub you've got to mitigate and replace a shrub um, those kinds of things. There were some other things for um, uh, Comar sections, natural resource article sections have all been updated to make sure they match with the state law. 
Um, those were some other changes. The variance process. So there is a variance process within the critical area section of the code. There was also a variance process in the general zoning code, 26711. We made sure that those processes are uh, consistent. Uh, we always had a variance provision. Um, Comar has that in their code. So it allows you to, as an applicant, to apply for a variance. Um, those procedures are set forth more clearly, and they're consistent with the other sections of the zoning code. That's another change that was made. Um, that, that's really the substantive changes. Like I said, the majority of this was a, a reorganization. <coughs> so that hopefully it is easier for people to understand. And all changes comply with Comar and the state law as we're required to. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Mr. Jandredana. Hi, good evening. Uh, Joel, good evening. Um, major question here. Number 22 slide, when stream no longer flows, buffer removed. So how many streams no longer flow? Which ones are they? Um, and why are they no longer flowing? Was that because there was construction done somewhere else that cut these streams off? So what you're telling me here is that this stream no longer flows, but it still might be in a 100-year or 500-year floodplain because that area doesn't go away. And now what you're telling me is it's going to get removed so that somebody can build on it. Is that correct? Well, the floodplain regulations didn't change. The floodplain well, but the map buffer remains. is being removed so that that can be built on, correct? The buffer is being removed in that place per the Why? Direction. Why is the buffer being removed? Why doesn't it just stay there? I mean, even though you're saying that stream is no longer there, if it rains or something happens, whatever, that stream was a stream. It still, it still could be in the floodplain, but you're going to tell me they're going to build now on that that no longer is a stream. Well, it's because this, this type of zoning is mapped based upon a natural feature, and so if the natural feature isn't there, you don't map the zoning. Okay. Who, who put this in that this buffer is removed is that the state is that is that the administration who do, who did that it was the initial uh, well the map was prepared by the state and then we went out and field checked it with them we didn't come to them and say hey you know we, we don't want to see this here we'd like to see that changed it was a, it was a process of the state's environmental planners preparing the maps how, how many streams are no longer flowing in the county. Do you know I don't, that? I, sitting here, I can't tell you, but I don't think there were too many examples, but we will get back to you with that information, sir. Okay. So we don't know which one. We don't, we, we can speculate why, because there was building going on, and there could be other streams that could also find this fate if other building is going on, that the streams will no longer flow, and that buffer will be removed and buildings will be built. If, and from, from my general understanding of this. Only in the, the cycle of reviewing the Chesapeake Bay critical area. We wouldn't be able to go back and do this in the interim. So it would be, take another decade before we'd be able to get back to looking at which streams are flowing and making changes. I don't know about my colleagues, but I look at this and I can't accept that. And, and, and that, that you remove the buffer for a stream, there's a 100 or a 500 year floodplain regardless, and you're going to be able to build on that. I can't accept that. So. And I need more answers on uh, how many streams, which ones are the streams, um, are these in floodplains or not in floodplains? Okay. We'll make sure you get that information. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Woods. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the presentation and, and the packet that was just outstanding. I, I agree with uh, Mr. Andrew The Was there any timeline that was put on any of the streams or drainages that how long it's been run dry or how long it hasn't flowed? before the buffer was removed? It, again, it was a, this was, this mapping was done by the state, so I didn't get into the specifics of it. At, you know, Is there someone we point. can reach out to? I know Jessica made today tried looking to find out some people that they could talk to about that. And they have notes on the mapping process that we could provide, certainly. Because we had a couple questions with that. And obviously, Council, you know, I'm on the Swift Water team for the county, and there's plenty of dry, drainages around the county where we've rescued people out of. There's zero changes to the floodplain map as a part of this process. Hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Buell. Thank you, Council President. Um, in answer to your question, uh, Tony G, as you know, I'm on the Critical Areas Commission. So I know there was a process that the staff went through to determine uh, whether a stream should be removed and there was a timeline and I'll you can look into that Joel and I'll look into it too because there was a lot of contention over that because some was added 
as I remember. Some mm -hmm. strings were added, but some were removed. But I'll, you can look into it. Yeah, some, it, 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 the buffer did go further up some streams yeah. based upon. But I, I know there was a lot of discussion at, you know, I'm on the Critical Areas yeah. Commission at the state level on that. And with that, I want to thank you uh, for the job that you've done. Yeah, we got to look at this stream issue. But I know the state was working on this. We were working on this for years. So I, you know, I know a lot of hard work went into this, and it hadn't been updated in over 30 years. But I just want to make one thing uh, perfectly clear. I know the answer. But to the general public here in Harford County, who is responsible for enforcing the critical area? Harford County. Okay, just want to make that clear so everybody understands that it's not the state, it is Harford County. That's we are right. subject to audits by the commission. Right, yeah, but, you know, but as far as enforcement, <coughs> we're leaving that at the county level. Yep. Okay, that's all I have, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Buell. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Council President. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I got a, 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 about three or four questions. And um, so, um, to Councilman uh, Tony G's um, uh, question, can a, can a stream be dammed so that it'll cut off that, that actual stream and then be taken out of the, the critical area? Have to be diverted. Um, I, it would, I mean, it would have to be a condition that was already in place before they did this mapping and the impoundment of you know of water is a subject to a whole other set of regulations so um, I I think that if you don't see it it's pretty unlikely to happen because of the difficulty that someone will have to go through with the state um, yes. but uh, it, I suppose anything that could affect the hydrology you know would could, could have impacted these maps but that was uh, um, those are the factors that went into the mapping with the state Okay, and uh, so uh, let's go back. You, you said uh, when you were talking about the Perryman Peninsula area, back, um, you, you gave a definition of the uh, critical area pro uh, program. What was that de definition again? Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure where, what section I was talking about, but the critical area is basically designed to allow us to live with nature adjacent to the Chesapeake Bay. So that's so the... the Buffer is is kind of the last um, part of it. It's a, you know you having this non disturbance area with trees in particular because the the capacity of trees to wick water up you know into the atmosphere instead of it washing you know into the bay directly with pollutants and speed and heat and all those other things is 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 what's causing pollution and issues in the bay. So. So the planners that in, invented the critical area, you know, and I guess the late 70s into the 80s, wanted that buffer in place. But the problem is, as you know from having lived in this community for many years, people already lived there. And so they had to come up with strategies. So that's why we have these different land uses, and that's why we have the buffer and the modified buffer. So, um, you know, from then on, so I, I would say most of the, heavy lifting of the critical area in terms of mapping it was in the very first round that this council went through in 84 or 85, wherever we did it. Um, most, of the, most of it since then has been pretty minor. This is the first time we've, we've adapted it to the present average tide line. Um, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, and, and that didn't yield significant uh, amounts of change. You get, I gave you the number of properties that were affected, but it's. Um, I think that for the most part, the tool has been in place since '85. You know, pretty much intact. And anything we did or we're doing here is because the state has directed us to do it. Okay. And I'm just going to give you uh, three three other things in in, sequ in sequence. Uh, mm -hmm. how, do, how do complaints come into your office? Uh, the enforcement arm, do you have enough folks uh, for your enforcement arm? Uh, fines, what are the fines? And what is the Comar section? Okay. Uh, I'm going to work with Alleggi on, Mrs. Alleggi on the last part, but the... Um, <laughs> the okay, there we go. But the... Um, uh, 
Uh, we have zoning enforcement staff in the Department of Planning and Zoning. Complaints do come in, sometimes directly to zoning enforcement staff. Sometimes they come to um, the planners that work with the critical area. And sometimes they come to the critical area commission staff. Uh, uh, um, I suppose they might come in to like see something, say something, other types of government functions. But um, you know, someone would be out kayaking and they notice something and they call it in. And so what happens from there? Sometimes what they're seeing is somebody who's following a permit and they're doing what they're allowed. Um, sometimes they do see somebody who's in violation. And the main way that this, this code enforces is go back to that example of the shed where you have to plant trees for a 200 square foot shed, certain number of trees. Well, when it's a violation, if you went out there and built that shed without a permit, four times the amount of mitigation. So that's how this code really gets you. Is And and it's a challenge for some some people. And so what I, since I have a mic and I'm in a public meeting, I'm going to remind people the best thing to do is give us a call and we'll work with you. The permits don't cost a thing. And we'll help you get through the process and make sure that you don't have to do four times the mitigation. Um, but uh, that didn't quite answer, answer all of your questions. I got a little sidetracked there, but. <laughs> the, well, well, the the uh, the two questions that that I really want to know too is is that the the, the fine like w when when does when when does it become a monetary fine? It, you know, first you get you know a, a nasty gram, and then next time you get a fine or or whatever the case may be. What uh, you know, how much is the fine, and who who presents that fine, or or how does a person go about? Okay. So it doesn't, we don't have the civil um, authority to give the tickets like you would get for a parking violation, so to speak. So it has to go to court to assess those fines. So primarily we work with people within, before it goes to court in terms of the mitigation and we use our power to stop them from getting other permits as a way to keep, get them to the process. And and the, the Comar section. Well, it's Title 27, I'll get to the specific section, but it's t Title 27 of the Code of Maryland Regulations is the title that governs DNR. Mm -hmm. DNR is the state statute that governs this. So uh, it's 27.01 and four other subtitles. I'll get to the exact section, but I don't have it memorized. But that is the overall title. So everything in Title 27 of Comar covers a critical area. And that's what you were trying to streamline, correct? Yes, all of those provisions have to be incorporated into our local code. Okay. So we, and, and that's been the case since, again, 1985. Um, and every time that gets updated, we get updated. But in addition to what Mr. Gallagher talked about far, as far as the enforcement goes, we have criminal proceedings, as I think you guys are all aware, as far as our zoning enforcement goes. This isn't any different. So just like if you violate any other provision of the zoning code, because this is incorporated into the zoning code, we have, it's, it's basically criminal charges. Um, they're not jailable, but there are fines that would be set by the court. So we don't implement that, but we would take action, file charges, they would be prosecuted for violations of the critical area, just like you would, could be prosecuted for violations of any other zoning code section. So it's, it's the same thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Joe, you mentioned 500 and some properties impacted, 51 on being county properties. What about state properties? What about personal property? Um, Private well, property. Yeah, the, so a number of those were state because they're Susquehanna State Park. Um, but I, when I get back to um, the other councilman's questions, I'll just get you the count. Thanks. Yeah. Mr. Ginger Dan. Hey, Joel, thanks. Is, is that, um, will that give us the addresses of all the properties that are going to be in, removed from the buffer zone, too? Well, I don't think any property was completely removed. I think what happened is you saw the line move a little bit on the property. But uh, of the, like, like Oh, this you mean one the here, buffer. I'm sorry. The, yeah, the you buffer. the buffer. Okay. Well, that list and show us where that's at in the acreage or something like that. Um, that might be some analysis to get to that. I'm not sure okay. uh, how, long, how long that would take. Yeah, where it's at. But I understand the question and we'll do you, see what we can do. Do you know do. how many there are? Like I said, I don't know off no. the top of my okay. head. Yeah, right. I apologize. I yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Council? Mr. Schroeds? Yes, just want to thank you for this presentation, but also taking the time to meet with us and not only you, Megan, but um, uh, Mr. Arkowski, Joel, Matt, um, taking the time to meet with us and myself personally. Um, 
How are the folks that, I guess primarily the RCA, that was all park property. We, we, we went over that a couple of times. But the, um, the other properties like the LDA specifically, um, if, if they were added into an area where it's going to be more restrictive, were they contacted? Did they have time to they were. get back to you and maybe meet on site, on the field? Because it does impact them. You know, they have to maybe do things they didn't have to do if, if it was expanded. I know we've been talking about the opposite of that, where maybe a buffer was removed, but, um, of course, they're probably not going to complain because it may open, open it up a little bit, you know. Um, but in the cases where it's now more restrictive, you know, how, how did that process go? Um, what we... In any case, uh, they got a card that said the changes that were happening, and they were invited to contact um, the state official, actually. To, mm -hmm. So um, they, they handled it directly because it kind of gets back to the who did the mapping. Well, it was really the state that did the mapping. We went out and field checked it with them, but we didn't have any you know, uh, ability to make recommendations like you shouldn't shouldn't map this here or there because it was a scientific process really it's like the high tide line went up so the map moved it here that's basically what sure it did. now do they have the same mapping capabilities that we do in Hartford County I know that um, we we've got very good mapping capabilities in Hartford County. I'm very proud of our GIS system and the aerial photography and and everything that goes along with that it seems like um, you know, we can really drill down. Do, yep. do they have the same resolution? Yep. Yep. They use the same software. Um, they've got some people that are a little more capable with the remote sensing and doing the, you know, the algorithms to calculate the, uh, you know, how, how um, certain um, and geomorphology is being represented in the map. So I think, you know, it's good that they did the mapping. Probably, probably they, we can implement it as a zoning tool. Like as, as you know, we we do that all the time. But mm -hmm. when it comes to making the decisions about shoreline, and it's really better to have a scientist do that. So that's that's where it all started with the state. Right. Um, okay. Um, just trying to think. <coughs> All right. Now, would you be open to visiting, um, you know, to do a little field, you know, since we're talking about real properties, potentially to be termed real streams or not, um, you know, and, and I guess something that goes along with that, could it been that the prior maps maybe weren't field truth, that they weren't field certified, and they were just looking at the GIS maps and not actually going out there and walking these creek valleys and wetlands. I mean, when I was a development review planner, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And um, when that plan came in, you went out and you you field verified. You made sure it was either there or not there, whether it was with a, a soil probe or yeah. or just you know you know they're giving you one set of information and you print out your own set of GIS maps and you you pretty much march out there with your your muck boots, um, Andre. Yeah. And um, you know you you. You know, you see whether it's there or not, and Correct. possibly when were the last maps? Done? This was all done in 1972. So they were working with mylar, black and white uh, imagery, imagery. Yeah. So the imagery, uh, the, the lidar, all the technology that we have today, they did not have in 1972. Obviously, and perhaps they did not go out and do the good work that we do. I mean, back in 1972, how many planners did we have? Did we even have environmental planners that went to school and studied environmental planning? Well, they were, these would have been state officials mapping the high tide line, and then later on they came through and applied it right. in the 80s to this particular instrument. But, it's a, um, but they didn't go back then and double-check even in the 80s. They just used that 1972 survey. Yeah. I mean, some of the things that they surveyed were, you know, fishing catch information. Mm -hmm. You're so, basically well, taking measurements a, from a, a map that wasn't that clear. I mean, you take maps back into earlier generations, they don't even really, basically you had a cartographer that did these and you didn't have the, the, 
Yeah, I think it was Any a thoughtful process based today. upon the information they had available. Right. Yeah. But like in this case here, um, that's already a development community. And, it, you know, I guess where it may open it up a little bit, like if they wanted to build a shed in the backyard, it looks like this, this example. I mean, did it really, it, did, it doesn't look to me like it created any buildable lots or anything. It looks like they're built. It's, they're, yeah, they're it's already built. It just may impact if they wanted to put a, a shed in or a pool or uh, whatever, something like that, I guess. But would you be willing to meet us out there on some of these, you know, places like this where it, um, the buffer was taken away? That's where the real concern seems to be. Well, I'm certainly happy to visit in the site and double check things. Probably would want a commission member, you know, staff with present also. But the, uh, I think the question that was asked is to provide the examples and the changes as as a paperwork or you know, right. you know. So we'll do that right away and see where we are if there's still questions and. You know, certainly we're always willing to. It just might be helpful, helpful to have if a there's one -on -one thing on site with the maps and say, "This is where this is shown, and this is where it's going away." And we're walking it now, and you can see that it's perhaps not there, or maybe we'll determine it is there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. or maybe it's only there when you have a flashy storm. I don't know. It could be a ditch. Anyway. <laughs> get me going. I just keep going. You didn't kick me, though. You I didn't kick you, no. <laughs> I'm ready. But I wanted to. Um, anyone else before we move on? Miss Dixon, do we have anyone signed up? We do, Mr. President. We have eight this evening. Kate McDonald followed by Nancy Post. Just as a reminder, it would be three minutes. Hi, Kate Good McDonald, evening. 2100 Park Beach Drive. Um, I'm here tonight to just voice concern over the three bills, 2211, 12, and 13. They're all very complex with significant changes to the Chesapeake Bay critical area that impact Abbey Den Perryman along with other areas abutting the Bush and Gunpowder Rivers in Harford County. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I grasped everything I read because it, it just kind of was overwhelming. So I appreciate staff's presentation here because they did address a lot of my concerns. I'm not going to lie. This smelled like a Barry Glassman special when I first read it, that he was going to try to sneak in some um, loopholes and uh, options for variances to the developers out there. So I hope that's not the case. And if it, in fact, is just following state regulations, then I'm happy to see some concern. So when the Bush River ends up being six inches deep, in a few years that we have those same concerns. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Basically, thank you, staff, for the presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Nancy Post. My information is on file. Harford County citizens need more time to read and digest over 500 pages than prepare thoughtful comments while we work and handle life's responsibilities. I do not approve of the bills 22, 011, 012, and 013 as written. There are errors and missing information. Some content and changes are based on questionable, inaccurate, or outdated foundations. Harford County citizens deserve better than having these bills rushed into acceptance to possibly further grease the skids for developers and all those who profit from the destruction of Harford County's natural resources. Actions that are, would be 180 degrees away from what the purpose of what we've discussed here tonight should be. Climate change is only debatable in politics, but not in science or reality. Rising coastal waters will continue to move past any mean high tide demarcation made today. Therefore, not only should the protected critical areas be expanded, they should be down zoned to LDA and more practically to RCA. There should be no percentage cap, cap on RCA parcels. There should be a cap on IDA parcels. The maps are too vague. They are missing acreage dimensions, pervious surface 
coverage, et cetera. The Habitats of Local Significance map on page eight of Bill 22012 is missing the blue shaded habitat des designation shown in the legend, the sole purpose of the map. The Critical Areas Program in Harford County is understaffed. Over the past several years, a county le leadership mandate to reduce the number of positions countywide has left remaining employees attempting to the, do the work of two or more full-time positions. Important work is slipping through the cracks, especially the Harford County Chesapeake Bay Critical Areas Program, which is unable to enforce critical area regulations. Violations go unpunished. Harford County is responsible to monitor and enforce compliance. This gap in services demonstrates the low priority given to the protection of water quality, natural resources, and the communities who live and take part in recreational activities in the tidal waters. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Kathy Baker Brosh, followed by Stephanie Flash. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. Before I begin, I just want to make a comment about the buffer, and I believe that you should look at the uh, definition of intermittent stream, which this council voted to change. Ma'am, is that part of your comments? Um, okay. In 2018, Bill 18-036, I believe, um, and that is probably why that has been reclassified. So think about changing that uh, to make it uh, protect the environment. My name is Kathy ba Dr. Kathy Baker Brosh, uh, Bel Air. I'm the president of Otter Point Creek Alliance. The critical areas boundary lines on the maps in bill number 22-012 are inaccurate in some places by hundreds of feet and must be amended by the state critical areas commission before they are approved. The mean high tide line, also called the state wetland line, is used to draw the critical areas boundaries line. The, a team from the state and county determined the state wetland line. However, the line is not accurate in areas that were difficult for the team to access perhaps because they were on private property and inaccessible on foot, um, and perhaps because uh, the water was not at high tide at the time the team visited. Council members do not approve the bill in its form. The maps must be amended by the State Critical Areas Commission, the line redrawn accurately, and the habitat protected that is entitled to be protected. My concern lies chiefly with Otter Point Creek, Harford County's site of the Chesapeake Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve. It is the largest and one of the last remaining freshwater tidal marshes in the northern Chesapeake Bay. Portions of Otter Point Creek are listed in Bill Number 22-012 as significant habitats containing rare species. The Otter Point Creek Reserve is the site of decades of research in estuary science, estuary education, and recreational waters for the public. As such, it is deeply studied and well known by scientists and recreational boaters familiar with the tidal reaches. Acres of wetlands and forest buffer and hundreds of feet of tidal stream channel need to be added to be afforded the protection of the critical areas program. One of the species at the Otter Point Creek Reserve, tidal arrowhead, is on the list of rare, threatened, and endangered species of Harford County, and it grows in the tidal marsh habitat in the channel of Ha Ha Branch. The habitat is submerged at high tide and exposed at low tide, which is also accommodating to wild rice and many species of wading birds, ducks, and migrating shorebirds. Tidal Arrowhead, due to its designation on the list, requires a protection plan as stated in Harford County's Critical Areas Program, Bill Number 22-012, Chapter 9, Habitat Protection Areas, page 9-4. This state rare plant is currently threatened with polluted stormwater discharge from proposed upstream development. A protection plan is needed immediately. I request that you do not approve, approve the bill as it stands. Ask the Maryland Critical Areas Commission to amend the maps to reflect the actual mean high tide lines, specifically in Ha Ha Branch, which it shows uh, high tide line south of Route 40. It is actually north of the train trestle. This will increase the critical areas buffer around the Otter Point Creek Reserve and help to protect its water quality. I request that Harford County Critical Areas team create a protection program for the state rare plant tidal arrowhead. The Critical Areas Commission is awaiting your comments and eventual approval. This is the time for you to request accurate maps to better protect the habitat of Otter Point Creek 
and the citizens and the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Stephanie Flash with Friends of Harvard. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the three legislative bills regarding the Chesapeake Bay critical area. Uh, Friends of Harford is, as you know, dedicated to advocating for citizens' quality of life in Harford County through responsible land use and environmental policies. We do recognize the importance and we thank the staff for presenting tonight of updating language in the critical area program to be consistent with the state and the COMAR and the need to review land use policies for the development within these critical areas. But as you can hear tonight, the citizens' full understanding of the policies <laughs> that impact their neighborhoods and the preservation of Harford County's natural resources must be part of this decision-making process. That's why we respectfully request a community workshop similar to the development of the Green Infrastructure Plan held in 2016 um, to assist citizens in understanding the changes and to ask questions about the proposed uh, changes. As stated also, the, the bills, as you know, are 500 pages combined and the map is difficult to identify the areas that were discussed, the intensely developed areas, the limited development areas, and the resource conservation areas. If our members from the Regional Critical Area Commission in the Department of Natural Resources, Nick Kelly and Mr. Harris, along with Matt Krop from the Department of Planning and Zoning, could explain these in detail for the Critical Bay Area changes, I think many citizens would appreciate the opportunity for public participation just beyond a uh, public hearing. So at a minimum, please provide access to the map with greater detailed information on a larger scale for the citizens to review the shifts in the critical area boundaries. At this point, we ask for an amendment and for a workshop to be presented to the citizens. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Glenn Dutter followed by Bill Timnick. Good evening, sir. Good evening, gentlemen. Glenn Dutter, 1806 Park Beach Drive, Aberdeen, Maryland. Um, when I looked over the size of the bill, I'm sure uh, I was somewhat stunned by its complexity and by its extent, and I would assume you are too. And a lot of it, uh, I didn't have the expertise to deal with, so I just looked through it over again and picked out things that I do have expertise in. And one of the first things I, I noticed was that uh, areas that are important to forest interior dwelling birds, species, fibs, uh, is listed as important. But what it struck me is that, uh, oh, and also uh, colonial nesting birds. But what it struck me is, uh, why not marsh birds? In my area of the Bush River, we've got marshes, and there are things that, that nest and, and live in those marshes, like rails and bitters and some wrens. Uh, why aren't they in included that? And uh, I would not agree that these marshes are well protected. Um, second, I noticed that uh, in anadromous fish, the sturgeon wasn't mentioned. And there may well be streams that have the potential for sturgeon uh, spawning north of uh, Haverty Grace, even south of Haverty Grace. So it seems to me, at least in the county bill, that should be uh, mentioned. And it's, it's sensitive to me because there's a county over in the eastern shore that's trying to do its best to destroy a sturgeon spawning stream. Um, foresters, uh, forest and critical area and buffer can, uh, under certain cir circumstances, be uh, developed by permit and mitigation. And I know this is a holdover from the past, and I would like to suggest, for example, that there are certain wetlands that, and forests that because of where they are and the function that they perform, even though they're not in a critical area, are tremendous buffers to critical areas. And I offer example is uh, the uh, Abingdon Woods Project. That area is uh, extremely important to uh, Otter Point Creek and that freshwater marsh. That's already been mentioned. Um, as far as errors, I found the same errors, too, and uh, I didn't want to bring up all the errors that I, I saw because for fear of 
of being nitpicking. So just looking at the north part of uh, Bush River, I see that the Susquehanna River is a tributary of the bush. Uh, and that does need to be corrected. Or if that's the label of a road, I, I think another labeled road might be better, like Golden Ring Road. Um, so finally, gentlemen, given the extent of this, uh, we need some time and we need an opportunity to make input, and that's already been uh, suggested, so I'll stop at this point. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Council President, Council Members. Bill Tamek, 425 Latimer Road, Joppa. Uh, I found out today that I live in a critical area. Um, I suspect I've done several things wrong because nobody ever told me um, that what a critical area even was. I know I put in a drainage ditch that nobody said anything about. I know I put up a shed that was permitted, but I know nobody asked me to replace trees. Um, you already have Theo's letter, so I'm not going to go over that, right? Here's what I'll go over. I think the planning has been well done. I think the planning now has to go to the public to find out if it's right. And the way I think it should go to the public is critical area by critical area by critical area. Deer Creek, Swan Harbor, Oakington, Otter Point, Joppa. Uh, then people can look at the map with the planners and say, yeah, no. Or, yeah, that's good. But right now, you're going to be in the position of, if you go with this without taking it to the public, You'll be dictating, not leading, and I think leadership is what's needed on this. Thank you, sir. Ron Stuchinski, followed by Brittany Russell. Good evening, sir. Good evening. 319 Marina Avenue, Avenue, Maryland. Just a couple things. I do appreciate um, the explanation tonight. I do understand a little more on what, um, what this is all about. Tony G, great question about removing buffers. Um, I mean, if we're speaking to removing buffers because streams no, are no longer flow or vice versa, what causes streams not to flow besides building? Um, and if we're showing lines have moved over years, how do we know in 10 years lines won't move again and remove more tributaries, say, from the Bush River, et cetera? I don't know how that works, but... Um, and what's stopping the, you and from five years from removing buffer along possible warehouse slash freight distributions that are that are going to be built? What, what's protecting those buffers? Like, how does that happen? And I guess my last question is, what impact does building mega developments up against LDAs have on the CBCA? And that's where I'm at. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Brittany passes on our time. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? There are no more speakers, Mr. President. Thank you. With no more speakers, this uh, will conclude the public hearing. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking uh, very soon. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. We're going to take a short recess. Good evening, Chair. Calls to order legislative session day 22-018. I would ask you to please join us in standing for the pledge, followed by the opening prayer by Councilman Schroeds. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Heavenly Father, we stand before you conscious of the empowerment you have given us and aware that we, are, we gather here in your name. Tonight, we want to remember our veterans who have defended our freedoms as Americans that we enjoy. This week, Many of our students will graduate from our schools. I ask you that you look over each one of them as they enter a new phase of their life.
Guide us by your wisdom and support us by your power. As we gather in your name, may we temper justice with love so that our decisions may be pleasing to you and earn the reward promised to good faithful servants. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Council may I have general consent to move to item 5A on the agenda and return back to agenda item 4A thereafter. So moved. Thank you. Agenda item number five, consideration of petitions, applications, appointments, and nominations. Harford Living Treasurer John P. Carreri, Jr. may have a motion. Mr. Bueller. Thank you, Council President. I move to approve the Harford County Cultural Arts Board recommendation that John P. Carreri, Jr. be recognized as a Harford County Living Treasurer. Second. Thank you, Mr. Woods. It's been moved and seconded to approve Mr. Carreri as a Harford Living Treasurer. Are there any comments? Mr. Woods. Sure, why not? Well, being the other fire department person in the room, <laughs> I'm, I love seeing our fire department members uh, take care of this. And it's always been a voice of reason and someone I could lean to and call me if something's going on. So well-deserved and uh, my full support here with us. So thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else? Mr. Schroeds. I echo, I, I echo Councilman Woods' thoughts. Um, Mr. Carrari, you, you show up here quite often. You, you, I know you love our community, especially Havity Grace, the fire service. Um, I, I really don't remember you not being involved. Um, I've known you forever, and, and thank you for everything you've done for our great county. Appreciate it. You're a great living treasure. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schroeds. Anyone else? Very well. Ms. Dixon. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Woods. Aye. Mr. Jan Giordano. Aye. Mr. Schroeds. Aye. Mr. Wagner. Aye. Mr. Bula. Aye. Being seven votes in affirmative, zero in a negative, the appointment of John P. Carreri, Jr. as a Harford Living Treasurer is hereby approved. Agenda item number four, presentation of proclamations, Harford Living Treasurer, John P. Carreri, Jr., Mr. Bula to present. Would you please go down? Mr. Wagner. Whereas John P. Carreri Jr. received Carreri. the Hartford County Cultural Arts Board recommendation to the Hartford County Council that be, he be recognized as a Hartford, Hartford County living treasure. And whereas Mr. Carreri is a lifelong resident of Hartford County and lives in Haverty Grace with his wife, Linda. He is a graduate of the Leonard Hall Jr. Naval Academy, the John Carroll High School, and the University of Baltimore, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and whereas Mr. Carreri has served the community for over 50 years in various leadership roles. He was proud to follow in his family's footsteps by joining the fire and EMS service in Haverty Grace. Mr. Carreri continues to lead by example through the participation on numerous boards, including the Citizens Care and Rehabilitation Center and the Haverty Grace Ambulance Corps, where he is a trustee. Mr. Carreri is a past member of the Hartford Community Action Agency Board of Directors he served as the mayor of Haverty Grace from 2005 to 2007 and was a former coach for the Haverty Grace Little League, the Haverty Grace High School, and John Carroll High School football teams. He is also a lifelong member of St. Patrick's Church, and whereas John Carreri's memories of life in Hartford County remain vibrant and will be recorded for posterity. Now, therefore, we, the County Council of Hartford County, Maryland, on this seventh day of June 2022, do hereby proclaim John P. Carreri, Jr., a Hartford Living Treasure, and be it further known that his lifetime experiences and contribution to the Hartford County community will provide a permanent record which will recall the past, inform the present, and guide the future of Hartford County, and that his memories and history will be recorded by the Hartford County Public Library Oral Historian and will become part of the oral history collection of the library. John, you know I couldn't wait to get this one done. Nobody is more deserving of a living treasure than you are, Hartford County living treasure. And I am honored and blessed to consider you a friend because uh, 
you've given me advice over the last seven, eight years when I first ran for election. Uh, you've been a sounding board and a really a cherished friend, and I really do appreciate that. But uh, I knew a lot of the things that you did. I know I go to Havity Grace in the um, City Hall, and I see the list of the pictures of the mayors, and yours is there twice. And I noticed that you did not age a bit in 15 years. <laughs> yes. And I mean, just 50 years, 50 years of service to Havity Grace in Hartford County and all the things that you've been involved in. I just looked at it. I mean, a lot of them have already been mentioned, but 35 years of service as an elected official. Uh, you know, I got two pages of stuff here. Three. Yes, let see how wise keep us. <laughs> Three pages. <laughs> but uh, really, it, it's an honor to uh, present you with this proclamation as a Hartford County living treasure because you are truly a treasure anywhere. So I, I don't know what else to say, but thank you so much for all you've done for Hartford County, Havity Grace. Lived in Havity Grace all your life, too. Yes, I know. So I'm going to turn it over to you now. I know you have something to say. I know that you're a seasoned politician. <laughs> well, well, first of all, I got to thank the dear Lord that I'm even here. I passed the 70 mile, 70 years uh, back in October, and I got this phone call, and uh, I said, I said, geez, what I do to get this? And they said, well, you just turned 70, didn't you? <laughs> but anyway, I. <sighs> First of all, this is truly, I'm going to be a little selfish on this one because I've, I've received a few honors over the years. But this one here, ladies and gentlemen, I, is, is in my heart. Um, Howard Grace in Harford County, um, I just love it. I couldn't leave it. It's my home. Uh, it's my beautiful wife, Linda. I got to thank her, first of all. I got to thank everybody up here as well as for voting on the kind words, Curtis for for the call, and Mr. Wagner too. <laughs> but <Double team. coughs> I want—I just want to say it, it's been amazing the changes and the things that I've seen. Because honestly, I go back to when the commissioners ran Harford County. Um, one of them was my neighbor, Mr. Abe Davis. And one was the first mayor that I served with in Howard Grace, Frank Hutchins, mm -hmm. came up. And uh, this council president behind me, he, he knows a lot of the secrets. I think he knows where all the bodies are buried, right? <laughs> but anyway, I, I got to thank you all. I got to thank my family. I got my fire family's here. It's, this is Rusty Air from Harford County Fire Association here. Um, my sister Patricia is here. Uh, down on the other end is my cousins. And my sister-in-laws, my brother-in-law, John Blades, and my nephew, Stephen. And we have dear, very dear friends here, John and Mike and Mary Kundrat. But the one that's more important than anything is this one right here. Mm -hmm. She's got me through many challenges in my lifetime. And I wouldn't be here without her. So, uh, well, thank you. I just have to say I thank him for being a volunteer because 48 years ago, I was a young nurse coming out of Hartford Memorial Hospital, and he was a volunteer EMT. And he was there to pick up a patient, but I think he picked up me. <laughs> <laughs> Great choice. <laughs> Always on duty. It was love at first sight, and I'm forever grateful to my love for him. So thank you very much. I, I, I don't want you to get too much of the story here because it's pretty exciting so we can get to the library and read it. But one thing I got to say right now, all this was started, gave me the foundation to get involved in my community and, and, my, and my surrounding life were my, my mom and dad, mm -hmm. my father, John Paul Sr., um, my mom, Catherine, 
uh, Carreras Fruit Market where I met a ton of people over the years and delivering to all kind of places. But I want to give a shout out to my Aunt Barbara and Uncle Harry Wester, uh, my sister Margaret, her husband, they're all in the middle of graduations with their great grandkids and grandkids. So thank you all. Thank you all very much for being here. I love you. And back to you, Coach. I can't say any more. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. She did a good job. I'm proud. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to see you. I know. How you been, buddy? Good to see you. Good. Good seeing you. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Take care, yeah. 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 Oh, I know. Huh? <laughs> that's, 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 uh, not anymore. Mm-hmm. Good luck there. Thank you. Thank you. It's like council. Council, may I have general consent to skip over consideration of agenda items 4B and 4C until after completion of agenda item 14 and 5B? Agenda item number six, special presentations, we have none. Seven, approval of minutes, legislative day 22-017, May 24, 2022. Are there any corrections to the minutes? There being no corrections, the minutes stand approved. Agenda item number eight, introduction and consideration of resolutions. Mr. Vice President, please read resolution 018-22 and 019-22 into the record for introduction. Resolution number 018-22, introduced by Council President Ben Cindy, a resolution authorizing the county auditor to, to conduct an operational and performance auditing procedure, I'm sorry, to conduct operational and performance auditing procedures included in the fiscal year 2023 annual audit plan. Resolution number 019-22 introduced by Council President Vincini, a resolution to establish a search committee to secure and interview applicants for the position of the county health officer in order that the county council may make a recommendation to the Secretary of, Maryland, of the Maryland Department of Health. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Due to the nature of this resolution 019-22, it will be considered this evening. So may I have a motion, Mr. Wagner? Move for the approval of resolution 019-22. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mr. Jan Giordano. Let's move and second it to approve resolution 019-22. Are there any comments? Ms. Dixon. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Woods. Aye. Mr. Jan Giordano. Aye. Mr. Schroes. Aye. Mr. Wagner. Aye. Mr. Viola. Aye. Seven votes in the affirmative and zero in the negative. Resolution 019-22 is hereby approved. Agenda items nine. Yes. Thank you. 
Agenda item number 9 through 13, there is no business this evening. 14, new business, charter amendment ballot language, Mr. Wagner. We have um, two bills that require uh, the approval of the language. Harford County ballot question regarding Bill 22-005, question A, proposed amendment to the Harford County Charter, communication by council to obtain information to amend the Harford County Charter to permit the county council to directly communicate with county employees and the executive branch to obtain information. And the other question is uh, bill number 22-00, or bill number 22-007. Question B, or B, proposed amendment to the Harford County Charter, removal of council member to amend the Harford County Charter to establish the grounds and the process to remove a council member. Thank you. May I have a motion on Bill 22-005? I would have moved for the approval of uh, the, the uh, language that we have in front of us for Bill number 22-005. Second. Thank you, Mr. Jandrodano. It's been moved and seconded to approve Bill 22-005. Any discussion? It's actually the language for Thank you, Mr. Kearney. So again, we have a motion to, for the proposed ballot language. We have a second for the proposed ballot language. Is there any discussion? No. Ms. Dixon. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Woods? Aye. Mr. Jandrodano? Aye. Mr. Schroes? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mr. Bula? Aye. There's seven votes in the affirmative, zero in a negative. The proposed ballot language to Bill 22-005 is hereby approved. Ballot language for Bill 22-007. May I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Jandrodano. Moved and seconded to approve the ballot language for Bill 22-007. Is there any discussion? Just, Mr. Wagner. Just for a point, point of clarification to follow up on what Mr. Kearney had said earlier, <clears throat> the, um, the bills 22-005 and 22-007 were in front of this council some time ago, and we, we did approve them. This is just a formality that we have to approve language that will be going on the ballot for the general election uh, for the voters to uh, select which way they want to go on it because it is a charter amendment and it, this is just a matter of uh, blessing the language that we have here and sending it down to the state for them to approve it as well, correct? Correct. It goes to the Harford County Board of Elections okay. and then they, they will review it and assuming that they review the language and it will be placed on the ballot in November. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any discussion? Ms. Dixon. Mr. President, Aye. Mr. Johnson, Aye. Mr. Woods, Aye. Mr. Jandrodano, Aye. Mr. Schroes, Mr. Wagner, Aye. Mr. Bula. Aye. There are seven votes in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The proposed ballot language to Bill 22-007 is hereby approved. Fiscal year 23 council contracts. Council, you have before you a copy of the fiscal 23 contracts for Mr. Robert Cahoe, our zoning hearing examiner, Lisa Sheehan, our associate zoning Hear examiner, Brian Young, People's Counsel, and Andrew Chevalowski, associate People's Counsel. The personnel committee recommends the approval of these contracts. May I have general consent to approve the fiscal year 23 contracts? Thank you. Hearing no objections, the fiscal year 23 contracts are hereby approved. Council Personnel Committee, Mr. Woods. Thank you, Mr. President. Council, back when uh, we voted to make Council uh, Member then Wagner Council Vice President, I assumed that my duties on the Personnel Committee went with that. Apparently, I was wrong. So, with that, I would like to resign from the Personnel Committee and I would like to formally appoint the council vice president as the new member. So, Mr. President, I move to appoint Council Vice President Wagner to the Personnel Committee. Thank second. you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Jandrodenner. 
It's moved and seconded to approve the appointment of Council Vice President Wagner to the Personnel Committee. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Dixon. Mr. President? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Woods? Aye. Mr. Jandrodano? Aye. Mr. Schroes? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mr. Beulah? Aye. Seven votes in the affirmative, zero and negative. The appointment is hereby approved. We will now move back to agenda item 5B and 5C and then after return to agenda item 15. Agenda item 5, consideration of petitions, applications, appointments, and nominations. Harford County Health Officer Search Committee. Mr. Woods, may I have a motion? Mr. President, I move to appoint the following members to the Harford County Health Officer Search Committee. Council President Patrick Vincini. Personnel Committee, Council Member Andre Johnson, Personnel Committee, Council Vice President Robert Wagner, Personnel Committee, the County Executive or Designee, Dr. Russell Moy, Harford County Health Care Provider, Community, Barry Klein, Harford, Harford County Health Care Provider, Community, Dr. Catherine Fied, Fied, Fieldman, State Department of Health, Mary Nasuda, uh, Harford County resident and Vicki Jones, Harford County resident. Thank you. Um, may I have a second? Second. second. Mr. Wagner. It's been moved and seconded to approve the appointments for the Health Officer Search Committee. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Dixon. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Woods. Aye. Mr. Jandrodano. Aye. Mr. Schroeds, Aye. Mr. Wagner, Aye. Mr. Beulah. Aye. There being seven votes in the affirmative, zero and a negative, the appointments to the Harford County Health Officer Search Committee are hereby approved. Executive appointments, local management board may have a motion. Mr. Woods. I don't think I have that one. I thought you were moving someone else on that one. Mr. Wagner. Move for the uh, local management board appointment of Cora L. Grishkot. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Buell. Let's move a second to approve uh, the appointment to the local management board. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Dixon? Mr. President? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Woods? Aye. Mr. Jandrodano? Aye. Mr. Schroeds? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mr. Biola? Aye. Seven votes in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The appointment is hereby approved. Public Library Board Trustees, Mr. Schroeds? Council President, I make a motion to approve, turning to it, <laughs> the uh, student representative, David Simberg to the Harford County Public Library Board of Trustees. Thank you, may I have a second? Second. Mr. Wagner. It's been moved and seconded to approve the appointment uh, to the Public Board, Public Library Board of Trustees. Is there any discussion? Ms. Dixon. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Woods. Aye. Mr. Jandrodano. Aye. Mr. Schroes, Mr. Wagner, Aye. Mr. Beulah. Aye. Seven votes in the affirmative, zero and a negative. The appointment is hereby approved. Agenda item number 15, business from the president. Um, I need to announce our next adequate public facilities advisory board meeting is scheduled for Thursday, June 16th at 6 p.m. in the second floor county council conference room. Uh, this will be advertised again, I'm sure, on the website, and we will advertise it again next week. Um, I do want to go back, if I may, uh, to the um, Health Officer Search Committee. As you can see, we've added several different uh, members of the community. Uh, we listened to some of the uh, community in the past uh, have a desire to want to participate. Uh, and we listened to them and have approved some of them uh, to be on this committee. So looking forward to working with them. Um, this past week, or this week, I guess I should say, uh, we started both last week with graduation at HCC, and then this week with Harford County Public Schools. Um, all of us have been attending these uh, graduations, and um, tomorrow I'm extremely uh, proud to be attending my uh, grandson's graduation at Havdegrace. Looking forward to that with my family. So 
Um, we also had tours, uh, different uh, community, or excuse me, different agencies throughout the community. Uh, we did the Hartford Community Action Agency tour uh, with Brian Wayne, Wainwright. Uh, we visited the Highland School today. And then this past Saturday, we helped celebrate the third annual Shar Hope Corral for Hope uh, with Mr. Derek Hopkins and his uh, Shar Hope family. It was an outstanding event, beautiful day. Um, and uh, I'm sure um, they will be here with us uh, for a long time, uh, taking care of those people in need. So um, with that, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Council President. I'll just be very short uh, tonight. I want to uh, congratulate all the uh, the graduating seniors from our from our public schools and from the college. Uh, we definitely have the uh, the you know the the best and the brightest uh, coming out of our public schools. Uh, I want to send a shout out to some of the the or, or the graduating class of of Joppa Town. They've had uh, 4.5 mm -hmm. graduates. They've had uh, kids going from you know. Uh, Georgia all the way to uh, HBCUs. So uh, just congratulations to, to all the kids, uh, all the kids, all the young adults uh, that are graduating now in, uh, from, our, uh, from our public school system. So with that, Council President, I'll yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Woods. Thank you, Mr. President. Congratulations to all the graduates and thank you to all the teachers and educators that helped them get through this. Also uh, to the parents that Help support them along the way. This is now the rainy season and we're going into hurricane season, so please uh, take caution. Don't drive through standing water. As I always say, turn around, don't drown. And uh, with that, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Mr. Giandrodano. Thank you, Council President. Uh, yesterday was the 78th anniversary of D-Day. Um, we do honor all those who uh, call duty. That day of service we should never forget. We know there's still a war going on. Uh, over in Ukraine. I don't know if it's more of a war of just a, an occupation and people are dying. So please keep those people in your, in your uh, thoughts and all of our servicemen, service women that have um, that certainly um, lost their lives. So uh, again, um, I'd like to congratulate uh, class of 22, went to Patterson Mill, going to Bel Air tomorrow and see Milton Wright on, uh, I think, Thursday. And uh, congratulations to Sergeant Phillips, Hartford County Sheriff's Office raising more than 5,000 for the Humane Society. Mm. Because of his fundraising, Sergeant Phillips was joined by other members of the Sheriff's Office Sunday during the Bel Air Town Run and ran while suited up in tactical gear while carrying rams as he promised on as uh, to their donate donators. So congratulations again and uh, congratulations to um, Bel Air Police Officer Tara Negrady. She was promoted to Officer First Class with the Bel Air Police Department since joining in 2020. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Janger and Mr. Schroeds. Thank you, Council President. Um, I also attended the Shar Hope Foundation's annual fundraiser, and hats off to everyone that makes, um, uh, pulls that off with such great success in combating addiction in a farm kind of atmosphere. So hats off to my friend Derek Hopkins, all the board members, and all those that make that happen. Um, there was also a Center for the Arts fundraiser over the weekend held in Hunt Valley. I know they raised a lot of money for their cause and congratulations to them on that. Um, um, graduations, of course, this week. I've attended um, all of them so far. I plan to attend the rest that are coming. Uh, special congratulations to my nephew, Patrick, who graduated from North Hartford this evening. And I wish him very best in all of his future endeavors. Congratulations to NEMS, Northeast Maryland Select Lacrosse. They celebrated their 25th anniversary and that was founded by um, friends of mine uh, the McHughes their father Jim um, he got that started along with many volunteers that make that happen uh, year in year out um, basically year round so it does great things and prepares um, our, our youngsters for um, you know competitive athletics and lacrosse um, Want to uh, pass condolences on to my legislative aide Aurora on the passing of her uncle. Mm -hmm. And lastly, on a happier note, I want to wish my dear friend Gene Street, Dr. Street of Boyd and Fulford Drugstore, a happy 92nd birthday today. Sure, That's all I have. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Schroeds. Mr. Wagner. On a sad note, I do want to pass along that uh, Betty Fife 
uh, her married name is Lou Becker, uh, but we all knew her as Betty Fife, was employed with the county, uh, the county council offices from 1981 and retired in 1995. Uh, she served as the assistant to the secretary of the council. She passed on May 27th, uh, 2022, and there will be a celebration of life service held on June 11th at 11 a.m. at Bethel Temple in uh, East Joppa Road, Baltimore. Uh, this coming Saturday is the second Saturday's massive block party in Aberdeen Festival Park, and they've got a lot of act uh, activities planned for that. Uh, the city of Aberdeen is working with the American Ramp Company to build a state-of-the-art skate park at North Dean Park, and you can participate in surveys for this if, and provide feedback on the city of Aberdeen's website. Uh, Eric, or not Eric, <laughs> Roby Fowler uh, retired from Parks and Recreation after I believe it was 20, 23 years, I think it was, uh, last week. And then we've attended Bakersfield Elementary School Family Night, and we've certainly attended uh, some of the graduations that are, that are out there and, and wish all the graduates the very best. Uh, this past week I met with a representative from the Mental Health uh, Core Service Agency of Hartford County and Lieutenant uh, Ryber from Aberdeen to discuss uh, homeless issues and addiction problems and some of the stuff that we've got going on that's uh, within our communities um, that are still going on and, and when we get a little bit past uh, get a little breather I'm going to start back up with some more meetings and, and add some more direction to uh, what we've got going on with the addiction side the mental health side and also with the, the homeless communities um, I did go to Hall's Crossroads Elementary School the other week and uh, that was for their career and uh, a college uh, thing with fourth graders and uh, all, the, all the children had to ask me, I mean, it started out wanting to know when you walk in with a suit, are you the president? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you know the president? No. And I mentioned the farm and that just took things off to a whole nother level when they found out that I grew up on a farm and that just everything else after that was all farm related. So. I got a thank you note back from them, and it certainly it was a great time to see all the children and visit the classrooms and talk with them, and uh, it, was, it was a good time. It, they, it never ceased to amaze you what they can come up with sometimes in questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Bueller. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, too, would like to say congratulations to all the uh, graduating class of 2022 and to all the educators and the parents, the grandparents and the guardians that help to uh, get these young people to this point in their life. Um, and I will be attending the Avery Grace graduation. I think yeah, it's tomorrow morning at nine. And also, um, I just want to acknowledge all our veterans and um, I believe it was Councilman Tony G that stated yesterday was the celebration of D-Day. And we need to remember uh, the sacrifice that all these young men made on that day and all the veterans that uh, sacrificed their lives, made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could enjoy the freedoms that we have today. Thank you, Council President. That's Thank you, all Mr. I have. Bueller. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, uh, Mr. Jan Giordano. Yeah, very, something very important. I actually drove to... Uh, North Carolina went to a graduation at 8 a.m. for my girlfriend's uh, daughter, uh, Shelly Rose. So uh, it was definitely uh, a long trip, but very well worth it. And best of luck to her at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. There was quite a lot of people there. So thank you. Thank you, Council President. Absolutely. Uh, agenda item number 17, comments and input from attending citizens. Ms. Dixon, do we have anyone signed up? We do, Mr. President. We have six this evening. Okay. I uh, just remind everyone of your time constraints, three minutes, and call your first speaker. Nancy Post, followed by Verna White. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, again, my information's on file. Abingdon Woods is the last large contiguous stand of unprotected forest south of Route 95 in the Otter Point Creek watershed area. Abingdon Woods is surrounded by overdevelopment. The Haha -Ha Branch originates north of Route 95 among overdevelopment. Protecting the Haha -Ha Branch that tra traverses Abingdon Woods is critical. In less than 0.5, in less than half a mile south of where the Haha -Ha crosses Route 7, it empties into the Otter Point Creek estuary. 
Forests improve water quality by providing natural filtering and more. Pervious land areas recharge water aquifers. God forbid we are hit with a multi-decade drought like out west. Yes, our turn could come and the streams could dry up. We cannot afford to pave over most of our water sources. We need to think and plan not just for today, but for the impact felt a, dec a decade or more into the future. Avenim Woods needs to be included in, in the Chesapeake Bay Critical Area Program as a critical watershed habitat. It was faulty judgment at best that it does not have that designation already. Southern Harford is saturated with impervious surfaces. Instead of destroying God-given natural habitat, redevelopment needs to occur in shuttered business areas. The cumulative negative effects of bad judgment and decision-making is devastating, especially to future generations. We must be selfless stewards of the natural habitat we are so fortunate to have around us. Besides unused warehouses existing in Harford County, over seven businesses in the Perryman Peninsula Warehouse District have help wanted signs posted. Harford does not need more warehouses or low wage jobs. Why was a moratorium and changing laws to protect 15 acres from a small farm brewery in northern Harford County okay, but there is an unwillingness to fight with even 5% of that effort to protect 1,037 acres from many mega warehouses in southern Harford County. Southern Harford needs natural areas and less water, air, and noise pollution. What trumps our pleas to protect our communities? We need Harford County officials to do what is best for Harford citizens today, tomorrow, and decades to come. I want to uh, also applaud, I have a little time, uh, Councilman G's concern regarding uh, dry streams. That is alarming. We need that not to happen to the Ha Ha branch or any other streams. It's our responsibility to make sure that does not happen. Um, also, the mitigation for destruction. Not all trees and plants are pro uh, provide the same value. Like ice cream and salad, they don't <coughs> provide the same value. Uh, it needs to be more than a check bark mark. We need to plant trees and uh, plants that are provide critical uh, resources, and they need to survive past their planting. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I do not see Mrs. White. Greg LaCour, followed by Kate McDonald. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Greg LaCour, 1820 Park Beach Drive, Perryman. Um, I've been coming to uh, these meetings now for a little bit over six months, taking a couple weeks off because of the disappointment that I've had. I've watched you all tonight, I think it was uh, seven times voted right across the board, very easy. Our moratorium came, uh, came up for a vote, he gave it seven, right across the board, really nice. After that day, nothing. But we did hear from a council person that was in a local pub telling somebody the next day, don't worry about it, it was just a show. It's not gonna go through, okay? Get a little bit disappointed with that. But then there's highlights. This, Tar and the chip and tars that was put in our area over the last couple weeks. Is that proper? Is that the right pavement? So antiquated. Is this what Perryman's going to be getting? Tonight I learned that our councilman is on the critical with the, the Governor Hogan. What have you done for uh, Abington Woods and Perryman? I'd like you to like, you know, bring that back to us. Throughout this time, I tried being respectful. I was told by a couple people here, don't bring up elections. Don't. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to hear about that. Get calls from the person lying to me. But I'll go along with it. Then somebody up here labeled our community a bunch of educated idiots. Guess what? We are educated. Okay? We really are. We're going forth. 
Now, I know they didn't, like, you know, want to vote because everybody was worried about a lawsuit. Lawsuits can be dropped any day, right? Any day. We're not done. What have you done for Perryman? Abington Woods, and I'd like to, like, with my contacts, call Governor Hogan and find out if there's any success stories there because there is an election coming up. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Kate McDonald, 2100 Park Beach Drive. Tonight I'm going to address my comments to the people of Perryman, the unincorporated areas of Aberdeen, Abingdon, and Edgewood, who are all the victims of these egregious zoning policies and practices. And for all those all over Harford County who have been supportive of the 3P fight for the past seven months, we do appreciate that. Please do not get discouraged. This fight is far from over. While it would have been nice to get the totally responsible and completely legal moratorium to be able to further studies and make sure our community and our water supply remain safe, the council chose to be on the side of the developer and do battle with the people they were elected to represent. They all completely failed us. In military terms, instead of standing on the wall and protecting us, you jumped off of it and hid behind it. Very disappointing. Our moratorium was no more illegal than the one passed a year before for the farm brewery. It wasn't. We all know that, but we must move forward. If we quit now, then they'll definitely take every opportunity to continually degrade our quality of life and our environment for their benefit by allowing unfavorable, disproportionate development in South, South Harford County while enacting legislation to protect their own backyards. We must draw our line in the sand and fight with everything we have on this issue. If you'd like to learn how to join us and help us, go to www.protectperryman.com. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Kathy McGill, followed by Ron Stuchensky. Good evening, ma'am. Hi, my name is Kathy McGill. My information is on file. I'm here to talk about election integrity. I um, am very concerned about it. Midterms are coming up. 2024 is just around the corner. I just watched 2,000 Mules. I don't know if anybody else has watched it, but obviously there's nefarious people out there that would like to um, tatter our elections, our fair elections. I uh, went to, uh, I emailed Stephanie Taylor and I went to the Board of Elections last month. And I found out a couple things that I was unaware of. One is, we have no videotape from the drop boxes. Um, by Maryland law, we're supposed to keep those videotapes for 24 months. I was unaware of that. Um, I found out that we have no signature verifications anymore. So basically, Maryland has destroyed any safeguards against fair elections. We have no voter ID. We have no signature verification. We have unsecure drop boxes. We have no restrictions on mail-in ballots. We don't have an election day. We have an election week. And CISA, or CISA just came out from the Department of um, Homeland Security and said that the election machines can be hacked. So we do not have secure election machines. So I want to know what the politicians are going to, in this room are going to do to help that you can face me and say that this midterm and 2024 will be secure. How can you say that to me, knowing that all these safeguards or have been destroyed. What happened? What happened to Maryland? I feel like I live in a banana republic. I really do. We have no safe elections anymore. What are you doing to push back on this as politicians? Are you going to go to the election board and make sure that they're doing their job? And who 
who is going to be responsible for not following the Maryland law? I have Stephanie Taylor's email here, and it's, it states that she has no videotape. Who's going to get fired over this? This is Maryland law. And um, I just hope that you listen to the constituents, that you push back on this and, and, and help us have fair elections. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Ron Stuchinsky, 319 Marina Avenue, Aberdeen, Maryland. Um, I'm up here, I guess, to uh, pony up on what Greg was saying, the disappointment, which I know obviously a lot of you know we have in the council today in Perryman. Um, particularly, I'm going to ask our councilman again, um, Mr. Beulah. It's been 147 days since January 11th on that, that, com that statement that you gave up there. Um, first was that you've gotten more traffic and safety complaints from the Perryman community than all the rest of your constituents combined. And I'm just asking you, and if you can get back to us when you can, what has been done? What's changed in the seven years that you've been there that's helped us as a community become safer, traffic-wise, anything down there? Also, you told us that what we didn't need any more of were warehouses on the Perryman Peninsula. You said that you were going to meet with a council lawyer to find out what can be done to protect our peninsula. And I'm asking you again, six months, five months later, what has been done? Like what was talked about with the council lawyer to help us? Because again, you represent us, not the developers, even though it took less than 24 hours for Barry Glassman to veto it and send it down and everybody knew it was not a good moratorium. We, we all knew the game. We knew, we knew the game that was coming. And unfortunately, now the game is going to be longer, more drawn out, and, and it's going to cost every taxpayer in Hartford County money in the long run. Because if the county lawyer has to represent you, then that, he has to represent all of us. And it's sad. It's, it's sad that we're going through this right now. Barry Glassman still hasn't talked to us. It's been six months, but I want Barry to know. And Barry, you can see me. I, I'm sure I will see you at events coming up, and I will try and talk to you. Um, but, but I still want to know, at what point do the residents come first? That's all. And I'll yield the rest of my time if you'd like to answer any of my questions. There Thank are, you, Ron. There are no more speakers, Mr. President. With no other speakers, this meeting will be adjourned.